very impressed. <laughs> you remind me of my Chloe Bullingsburg days. Talk about book binding to, uh, to an audience. This is great. I appreciate everybody coming on in such a cold night. That's uh, that's fair. This is a great turnout. Wow, okay. I'd like to thank Mark uh, and Anne. It's coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And as well, this was really Anne's uh, brainstorm. She kind of organized, helped me organize this. So I really appreciate it. Appreciate that. Um, so my name is Ramon Townsend, and uh, I've been bookbinding since the 1970s. I'll give you a little bit of my uh, my background, uh, sort of by by bona fides as to what gives me the right to talk to you tonight about uh, my craft. Okay, uh, I was a student at the College of William Mary, which is of course located in uh, Williamsburg, and I'm from New York, and I didn't. Uh, I was paying out-of-state tuition, which was a whole $5,000 a year, I think, at the time. It might not even have been that much at the time. But still, for my folks, that was kind of a load. There were four of us in college at the same time. So uh, we, uh, I needed to find a job to help uh, offset the cost of my education. So one of the kids, one of the Virginians, uh, I mentioned them, you know, where can I go find a job around here? It's a small town like Williamsburg. And he said, well, uh, calling Williamsburg, hires uh, students all the time, uh, which I didn't even know what Colonial Williamsburg was. I'd never been to Williamsburg before, never even heard of it before. So they directed me to walk down to the employment office, and the um, lady took, took a look at me and said, you look like a nice young kid. I'll walk you over to the uh, master printer, the master book binder. I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> so I just followed her, and she walked me over there, and I actually started at the print shop, the master printer looked me over and said, yeah, he, you know, he can, he can put two sentences together. Uh, he's, he can operate a, what we call a, uh, a common press, uh, which the same kind of press that Gutenberg had invented. That's what we used. And so um, they gave me the job. And I worked that in the print shop for, I can't remember now if it was maybe six months, but across the, if you ever been to the, to the, uh, uh, the shop, there's the book bundle, there's a print shop on one side, a little alley, and then the, the uh, book binding on the opposite side. But we were all a little more in a community, and we all knew each other. So I told the master book printer, I really want to be a book binder. And uh, he said, go talk to the Hezekiah, who was the master book binder, and see if he'll you know, take you on. So I walked over and talked to Hezekiah, and he said, sure, come on over. So that's when I started my book binding uh, career. Um, I did not go to William Mary in order to become a book binder. I was a pre-law student, so um, I would spend my days uh, studying. Well, I, I think worked maybe thinking back. I think I worked about 30 hours a week in the book bindery, and then I was a full-time student uh, as well. I really enjoyed the book binding, though. In fact, I remember once calling my mom and saying, uh, "Mom, I'm really liking this book binding thing, and I'm thinking about quitting school." And that didn't set very well with my mom, so I ended up having a dual career. Uh, I left away the uh, uh, William Mary. I graduated from William Mary in 1980. Uh, I, I stayed on at the book bungee for two more years full time because I really wanted to cement the craft. And then when I felt, well, the last thing they teach was gold tooling, gilding and leather. And when I had been introduced to that, I was able to actually do it myself. I'd seen them doing it for four or five years at the time I was there, but I didn't actually do it myself until the end. So uh, once I got um, a pretty good feel for the gold tooling, that's when I went to uh, law school. So for the past, I passed the bar in 1987. So since 1987, I've been spending my days uh, practicing law, mainly in Philadelphia. I'm a trial lawyer. And then I come home and work in books at night. Mm -hmm. So there's more, for example, today was a typical day for me. I was in deposition for five hours uh, with about five other lawyers. And then I dashed up here and giving you this presentation. Not uncommon for me to do that. And I spend my weekends working on old books. I, we, so I have an, a business. My daughter and I, about six or seven years ago, for, for many, many years, I just repaired books and made books as gifts for friends. And uh, never charged a dime for it. I just loved the craft and I just kept my, kept my hands in it. Uh, but about six or seven years ago, my daughter asked me what I was going to do when I retired from practicing law, which I probably will never do, to tell you the truth. I can do it for the rest of my life. But I said, well, I'm, I'm a bookbinder. I can always do bookbinding. Uh, so she said, well, why don't you start making some money at it? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you 
<laughs> right. <laughs> so she and I started a business called Colonial Bindery, where we uh, repair books. Uh, well, I repair the books. And then she was doing the marbling. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the marbling. Here's the marble paper passing around. And uh, here's the marble um, scarf. Because I taught all my kids. I have four kids, and I taught them all the crafts. She's the only one that really does them. You know, my son's going you know, when you start talking about it, my son's and my crafts. Uh, so uh, we do, uh, we start with marbling and, and uh, book binding. And uh, then we start doing a lot of workshops. And we do a lot of workshops now. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a place called Sugartown, which is in Malvern. And we have a really, if you've never been to Sugartown in Malvern, please take the time to go. It's not that far from here, and it's a li great little spot, a little 18th, 19th century village that we have there. And uh, they have a book bindery that, a traditional book bindery, equal to what I had in Williamsburg. And uh, we do a lot of workshops there. I do about 30 workshops a year there um, nowadays. Um, we do marbling, book repair, book binding, and uh, gold tooling workshops are there. So if you want to check, check, that, check that out, you can go to my website, colonialbindery.com, um, or go to historicsugartown.org, and you can see uh, what, uh, what workshops we're, we're offering and, and uh, when, they're, when they're being offered. Uh, so that's what, so, uh, to go back to, so Chloe Bindery started out with my daughter and me. It sort of expanded since then. Um, I got so busy with the book repair work, a lot of family Bibles. If you want to see examples of some of the work we've done, that over there is a family Bible we just repaired. Um, this is a family Bible we just finished repairing, with, so I just made a little sample for you. This is how it came to us. And that's not unusual. They've been loved to death, these books. You know, back in those days, you had a family, that, that was pretty much the book you had, right? In the 18th, early 19th century. So it came to us like this, and it was a, it was a mess. But over some time, uh, we got it back together. Um, and uh, where's the final product here? Came out really nice. And this was from a guy who maybe four years ago walked into the into the bindery, started doing, uh, saw what we were doing, um, started taking workshops with me, took a bunch of workshops with me, and then decided he was going to go around the country take workshops at other place, places, and got his skills to the point where I felt comfortable letting him do my overflow work, because I was swamped. And now he's to the point where he's been, been able to repair a book a family Bible like that, so that's really wonderful. I'm glad to see I've been able to pass on my crafts like that. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do tonight is, I do, I call it, sometimes I call this a tell and show, sometimes it's a show and tell, depending on which, how I start. Sometimes when I do a uh, show and tell, I show you a little bit about the craft and how we do some of the book binding. But I think today we'll do a tell and show where we'll talk about um, the way books found the evolution of the written word, which is just basically a sort of a history, a chronology about how we got from uh, the Mesopotamia and uh, cuneiform writing up to, why well, stop in the uh, mid 19th century is where I stopped. It takes about, just about a 20 minute journey, okay? And um, if you have any questions along the way, please. You know, pepper me with the questions. If I can answer them, I will. Uh, I'll make something up if I can't answer. <laughs> I have a question already. Sure. So the marbling, I always associated that with paper. You, you've marbled the oh. fabric? Anything that is fibrous. You can't marble glass. You can't marble metal. You can marble wood. We do a lot of silk marbling. We have special workshops where we do silk uh, marbling or bandanas, cloth bandanas as well. Um, leather, you can marble leather. It just has to be able to, so the marbling, the part of the marbling process is you ha have to rub alum salt. Liquid, you liquefy alum and rub it onto the, uh, whatever you're going to marble, and that gets absorbed into the fiber. And, one, and the, map, the, the alum is the mordant. It's what the chemical that will accept the colors and fix them. Uh, so you can't do that with metal or glass, for example, but anything that's fibrous will accept the alum. But some things work better than others. Silk works great, cotton, mm -hmm. wool, not very well, good, good at all. Okay? Yeah. All right? So let's start our little walk. Um, let's see if I do this right. 
Down goes forward. Mark. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oops, I went far too far. Okay. So the ideal communication medium has five components to it. You want it to be compact, durable, functional, and I define functional as uh, you're going to get your message across in a permanent form. All right. Inexpensive and aesthetically pleasing. So we're going to talk about how from the time of uh, uh, mud tablets in Mesopotamia up to Gutenberg, they're trying to find this perfect combination of all these things. Okay? Okay. So just talk about evolution of uh, communication in general, right? Uh, uh, was it Dr. Watson? come here and help me or something like that is what uh, uh, Bell Graham, uh, Alexander Graham Bell said. So, you know, you got to start with this really scratchy uh, uh, sound, goes through a wire, transmitted through a wire, and it gets, you know, you're off to a rough start, but it got, it got started. Uh, the, you then graduate up to uh, my grandmother or great-grandmother's telephone, right? Um, and then, of course, we get up to the phone that most of us were familiar with back in the, back in the day, right? Um, I think it's interesting that we still say uh, dial the telephone, mm -hmm. and we still say hang up the telephone. My kids, are, our kids, have no idea what that means, right? But we know where that came from, right? Uh, and then we have Gordon Gecko with the initial cell phone, <laughs> bigger than his head almost, right? And then, of course, what we have, oh, let me make sure our... Make sure I've turned off my phone. My, my kids will probably call me and say, Dad, where's the peanut butter? And I'll be really embarrassed. But make sure I did that. Yeah, okay, so, okay, and now we have the cell phone, right? Now, let's think about this. We're looking for, um, let's go back to the, gotta be compact, durable, functional, which is a written message in a permanent form, inexpensive, and aesthetically pleasing, okay? Okay, um, compact, durable, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. with the first one, maybe so. That's not compact, probably pretty expensive too. I can't imagine that many people in the early 1900s could afford a telephone, right? Um, aesthetically, mm -hmm. not so much. You're getting, now this is approaching it, getting a little bit better, right? All the qualities are kind of coming together in, in, in the uh, rotary phone. Uh, that's getting real close, real close. And bingo, we've really hit it. Think about your cell phone, okay? Compact, durable. I dropped mine a hundred times. You can drop it in the water. You can drop it in the toilet nowadays, and they're waterproof. Uh, functional. You, you can send all sorts of messages, permanent form, electronically. Uh, inexpensive. Now, a lot of people might say, hmm, but I'm going to ask you one question. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say four words. Is it four words? Long distance phone bill. <laughs> Right? That was not inexpensive, was it? Think about what think about the value you're getting when you're paying off. Oh, maybe what, one fifty a month, I don't know what it is for you know, on average. But think about all the stuff you're gonna get for one fifty a month with a cell phone. Not just talking on it, everything else that comes with it. It is inexpensive when you think about it. Anesthetic, they're pretty. They make them, they've designed them so now that they're 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 actually works of art almost. So you're getting there with, with the phone. The phone got, is getting there. All right. Oh, I'm still figuring this out, Mark. <laughs> Down. Okay. So, let's go back 6,000 years to um, the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Syria, you know, the Sumerians, uh, the, uh, who else was there, the, uh, the, the Babylonians, that whole gang. And they're, they're writing on clay tablets, cuneiform, right, which just means wedge writing. They would take a piece of mud, and they would have these wet, a wedge stylus, and they would write whatever they can write, whatever the language was. Um, and that's, uh, were cheaply used for economy business. Most of the cuneiform, and there's thousands and thousands, there are millions of pieces of cuneiform around today, all right? And, but most of the time, it's really boring stuff. Accounting and business. I did read a few years ago, I think it was a National Geographic, they found the earliest joke uh, <laughs> recently in a piece of cuneiform. 
Uh, but most of the time, it was just real dull stuff. Let's talk about the compact. Yeah, durable. They've lasted 6,000 years. Okay, functional. You get your message across in a written form. Inexpensive. It's dirt. And aesthetic, uh, kind of weak on the aesthetics. Okay. I'll do it, Mark. I'm gonna get there. There we go. All right. What's next? Steely. I've heard steadily, steely, Stella. Uh, just means it's a big rock, and you know, write something on it. Almost always some sort of government edict or decree. All right. Uh, Code of Hammurabi, Ten Commandments. Um, they wanted to put this big giant rock in a central place. And everybody had to, everybody would know, that's the law. You better go, you better govern your life by this or else you're in big trouble, right? Um, durable, get your message across in a permanent form, inexpensive, it's a rock. Aesthetics, not kind of questionable, um, but we're getting there. All right, the scroll, uh, made from papyrus. Uh, they made the Egyptians a fortune. They had a monopoly on papyrus. Some people say papyrus, I say papyrus. Um, and uh, so that was great, it was great for the, for the Egyptians. It's definitely an improvement over the clay tablets and the steely. Uh, you're, it's, uh, it's compact, relatively compact. Not as compact as the book, we're gonna get there in a minute. Uh, relatively, well, papyrus was expensive. Again, the Egyptians made a fortune of it, but it better than uh, some better than parchment, for example. Parchment was parchment and vellum. Or well, you hear different things. Uh, parchment might. You hear some people say parchment is um, uh, lambskin. Some say it's calfskin. Some say it's stillborn lamb, stillborn calf. But it, it was that this was cheaper than uh, this was cheaper than parchment or vellum. Um, aesthetic, yeah, pretty aesthetic as well. You're writing on it, nice handwriting on it. So you're getting close. Uh, to the ideal communication form. Well, what was that made of? That's papyrus, which is, uh, there's, you know, papyrus is a big reed, and they would open it up, and the pith, they would take the pith, and it was, they would cross-hatch the papyrus, basically, and beat it. And by beating the cross, the papyrus, it would kind of spread and form into a big mat. Okay? Uh, so just basically a big piece of glass that they would form into a mat, what they did. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans come up with the diptych, um, which was uh, just a piece of wood with, uh, that was hinged, and then in the center is wax. So it was the first erasable uh, message, uh, form of tra uh, transmitting messages. So this is cheap, just a piece of wood and some wax. Um, you, now, now you can't make a permanent message with this because you're going to just wax and it's going to erase. Um, what else are we looking for? Let's go back to our. It compact, yep, basic compact, inexpensive, aesthetic, sort of, kind of. Um, of course, now diptychs are also, also used by artists, right? You know, to be used to dip, 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 diptychs, so you can make something pretty out of a diptych. All right. And now we're going to come to my wheelhouse. As I said here, I'm starting to look like a book. We're getting there. Here you have the first book quote, unquote. Uh, you've heard of the codices. I'm sure if you're biblio, a, book, a book person, bibliophile, you've heard of the, the Roman codex. Uh, oh, thank you very much. And uh, these were tipped the paper with a paper, quote, paper was typically papyrus. Um, they would be, um, they, were, they were folded sheets. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, they would take two or four sheets and fold them. And then you would sew them the way I'm going to show you later on on the uh, sewing frame over there, um, with probably, for probably it might be flat. Not quite sure what they use as, a, as a sewing it with a thread. And then you put it together, and then you put they would put wooden boards on top. The Latin word for wood is might be codex, codex or something like similar to that. It would mean wood or bark, and that's why because they had wooden board because of the papyrus was sandwiched between wooden boards became known as a codex. Um, because of the wood, and that's what we still know that know them uh, and know as codex uh, codices today. So uh, you got four pages folded and stacked. Uh, leather thongs were so often used to sew together, and the wooden boards. This is really getting to all the things we were trying to to uh, find in our elements of the perfect 
communication device. It was compact. And for example, a scroll, you have to unroll it in order to read it. You don't have to do that with the codex. Durable. You've heard about, and I'm going to show you an example of the Nagar Hammurabi codex from the third century or so. Uh, they lasted for centuries and centuries. They were very functional. You get your messages across in written form. Inexpensive, not quite there yet. We're working on that. Anesthetics, you know, nice handwriting on papyrus and sandwich in a wooden board. Kind of nice. Going to divert, digress a little bit and talk about the Coptic bindings through the Christian book, the first century Gospels. Um, so these are codices, and uh, they were uh, really probably a big reason the Gospels and Christianity spread as rapidly as it did. The Romans invented the book, the Codex, but they were still wedded to they scroll. It took them about another 300 years to get off the scroll and just become, become uh, uh, just pretty much rely on the book. Okay? The Coptic Christians in Egypt immediately recognized in the first and second century this thing is a lot better than the scroll. It was more compact. You can walk around with it. You can hide it under your robe so that centurions aren't going to try to, you know, aren't, aren't going to try to steal it from you. It was just such an advantage. So the cop, most of the codices that we find today are actually Egyptian Coptic uh, Christian gospels. Um, so uh, they were basically leather covers without, but they did not have the wooden protection like the like the codex. Um, so just to make sure everybody's still awake. My daughter and I inserted a little a little. Something in here, for those of you who are awake or recognize what our, our uh, mistake by design, what, what do we do wrong here? The dates are off. Thank you, yeah. Hard to write the Gospels 300 years before Christ is born, right? <laughs> yeah, you had a question? I did. I was, when you said scroll, I wondered, was there any connection between the Oriental scroll? Did that occur at the same historical That was a great then? question. I'm going to give you my card. <laughs> I've never, no one ever asked me that because there is so much crossover between the East, right? Um, and there's so much of a vacuum, though you don't really know exactly what, like, like paper, for example. We know that that was uh, an Eastern invention. Uh, movable type was a Korean invention before Gutenberg, but we don't. There's no evidence that Gutenberg was aware of that. So there's a lot of there's like this vacuum where stuff is going on in the East. You think may have been. And I always say, listen, go back to Luke. Who were the first three people that visited the Christ in the manger? The Magi. They were from the east. So there was a lot of crossover. We just don't, but there's a missing, missing, there's some missing elements here. Yes? So the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found back in the 40s in the caves, were, were those actually written on scrolls? Is that? Yeah, so yeah. They They're papyrus. They were, okay. Thank mm -hmm. that, I'm pretty sure, I don't think they're parchment. I'm pretty sure they're papyrus. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Are those legible today? Oh, the Nag Hammurabi? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. It, oh, it's a fascinating. You know the story at all? These guys, uh, what kind, was it? Where were they again? They may have been Palestinians, maybe. And they, uh, they were, um, they found, they, I don't really remember, it might be something to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they threw something into a cave and something broke, and they said, what's down there? They find all these Gospels, a bunch of them. They take them back home, uh, show them to their mom. Their mom says, oh, these old things. She throws, starts throwing them in the fire for fuel. But the, son, the sons realize, wait a minute, these might be important. We might make, be able to make some money, in fact, off of these. So they take them to some art dealers, and before, and after a while, I realized this is a huge find. Is some of the original, uh, some of the original uh, gospels, yeah. So yeah, they're, they're legible, absolutely. There's, there's, th between Boston and D.C., there are thousands of codices. Okay, there's a lot of them in existence. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. uh, what language were these written in? They probably um, are they Amer Amerit? Yeah, must be Amerit. Yeah, Amerit. Yeah. Um, probably so. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What a great crowd. Okay. So we're going to make a big leap now from the Middle East 
and Africa to Europe. So um, this all be this pretty much the Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. They really were the ones who got this book binding thing going. Uh, and then through Islam and through up through Spain and then, and, and then going west. Uh, but finally sort of started taking on a, it's a, a, a life of its own and then you get some magnificent work uh, in, um, in Europe uh, though I have to say uh, some of the stuff that was in southern Spain is just eye-popping the um, what the Moors what the Moors were doing were just were just uh, fantastic but anyway the Europeans really started making them it really started making them into the just you know, works of art um, and also, and um, also, um, they pretty much focused on religious books, law books. Uh, alchemy was a big topic as well. That's pretty much what you saw coming out of Europe in the during the dark the dark ages. So for of course the Book of Kells, which is at Trinity College, I've never been there myself. I've never seen it. Uh, that's on the uh, bucket list. Um, the illuminated manuscripts, you know, the gorgeous. Coloration in the, the, the what's that called again? The first letter is called a, uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, and then, of course, books of hours, which were the Catholic books devoted to uh, uh, high holy days and things of that, that sort. So they really, it really make, made a, it, over the time from, you know, the first, second, tenth, first, second, third century with the copy bunnies up to the 10th, 11th century, you had this just this fantastic growth. At least, or development in the way books were um, being being produced. All right, and I cannot. I'll be remiss if I talk about book buying and not talk about paper. Um, so I have a couple of old books here. These are these are just from the 1700s, so they're not that old. But again, if you're familiar with old books. Uh, you see them. These are that's what you're what I'm passing on are very, very, uh, pretty much the usual fare you would see for books from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, or the 19th century. Uh, calf bindings, brown calf bindings, um, and uh, um, on on, parch or not on parchment on uh, linen rag paper. And that's really the point. What I'm trying to get to. I want you to notice the quality of the paper. And these books that you're that are being passed around right now, these books are going to outlast almost anything that's being printed today, right? Uh, they will last four or five hundred. These books are almost, I think the I think the Tom Jones is from 1749, so it's almost 300 years old. And look at the paper in it. Okay, uh, the paper making was was just the you just can't find anything to uh, beat it today, and we're going to talk about why a little, a little bit later. Um, so paper is really important, and then the method of construction, which I'm going to show you a little bit later on as well, where you have a sewing frame, you sew it by hand, uh, and then the, what the, putting it together, it's just an incredibly durable uh, piece of uh, uh, object. Um, okay. And the man of the hour, this is my personal hero. Without him, we would all still be living in the Middle Ages. That's probably not an exaggeration, right? Uh, he changed the world. Probably the most influential person of the last thousand years. Uh, and that's, again, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that. Um, he was uh, born in Mainz. Again, that's on the bucket list as, uh, as well. I've never been through this shop. Um, and he was a goldsmith, so he knew uh, the properties of metal. Very key, right? Um, and sometime, sometime around 1425, and I'm exactly sure, he started working in secret. Um, wasn't telling anybody what he was doing. A few people knew something was going on, but they didn't know what was going on, right? Um, and uh, sometime around 1450, he revealed his great project, or the, what he'd been working on for the past 25 years. Uh, he was working on the print press, which we call the common press, um, and movable type, uh, metal movable type. Now, I mentioned before that the Koreans had actually invented, quote, movable type. It was wooden, 
and it really was a block of type, not individual letters. Um, and also, very importantly, he invented the ink, because um, that, without the ink, this is not going to work. And so it took him many, many years also to develop the ink for this. Um, and as we all know, this changed everything. I wish I brought my uh, Boston Gazette. I have a Boston Gazette from 1730, which is pretty cool. But it would have been printed exactly the same way as you're seeing, what you're seeing, seeing here. Um, if you ever get a chance to see somebody set type and reuse a printing press like this, it's just fascinating. Letter press is wonderful stuff. Where did they make the ink out of? It was linseed oil and uh, lamp, lamp black. That was the basic combination. Gutenberg did something else. Again, he was a goldsmith. So he added some other metals to, I'm not quite sure what they were, because have you ever seen a, anybody ever seen a Gutenberg Bible? Mm -hmm. There's something about the way the ink reflects light. It's very unique. It kind of shines. It's not that dull black you usually see with um, ink and letterpress. He, he had some metals to it. He was a genius. He had some metals to it, and it just kind of jumps off the page at you. Uh, there, if you ever get a chance, again, between Boston and D.C., it must be five or six Gutenberg uh, Bibles that you can The Morgan has two, and the New York Library has one. So that's three in New York alone. Yeah. Uh, and then the, uh, the um, type was tin, antimony, and I'm missing the third one. Tin, antimony, and lead. <laughs> that, the, the most common one, lead, uh, was the, tin, the the type. But it took him 25 years to, uh, to put this all, all together. Okay. Doing wrong. I think the computer wants to yeah, oh. oh, yeah, just cl close that if you can. saying quit, should I take yeah, a Yeah, quit, quit, yeah. And it's saying stop. <sighs> now something about an F. Gosh. I can't get the, can't the, get the cursor. Should I say no to this? Not have an 18th century book on your operating <laughs> Still not moving? Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So 1452 is when the Bible started uh, with being I think there's 180? Some, either 180 were printed or 180 or no. Something like that. Um, and uh, by 1500, 20, to the, printing w was the worst kept secret of all time. Gutenberg tried his best to keep it on wraps. He wanted a monopoly on um, printing. Uh, but uh, w what happened was he uh, had, was borrowing a lot of money in order to um, uh, finance his work. And he, ended up, he had a lot of creditors. And when he started making these books and started making money, they wanted their money back. And he did not have the finances to uh, to pay everybody back, and he ended up going into bankruptcy. He made he he made first he made no money off of um, uh, printing. Uh, all the creditors took all of his equipment, and so he they basically by everything was taken. Other people then had the technology, and they it spread like wildfire. Uh, printing so that uh, unfortunately for Gutenberg, he died in fourteen I say fourteen sixty eight. 15, 16 years later, without making a penny off of his own, of the greatest invention of all time, uh, frankly. So 20 million books were made by 1500, which you take the 2,000 years before that, and they weren't even close to making 20 million books, um, you know, manuscripts. So do we have what we're looking for now? Is it aesthetic? Absolutely, they're gorgeous. Is it compact? Yeah, you can carry it around. Is it uh, a, a, a perfect medium? Uh, get your message across in a uh, in a permanent form. Absolutely, um, durable. Durable. Yes, they last. Thank you. I was looking for that one. The one downside. Well, the one downside at this point was still not inexpensive, but that didn't last very long. Uh, by 1500, books were relatively cheap because there were so many printing presses that were cranking them out. So books became a very. I will, I'm going to say use the word common. Yes. You had a question. 
So that page, it's illustrated with all of the flowers. And is oh. the, was that the actual Bible? That's that the Gutenberg. Oh, they're gorgeous. If you've never seen a Gutenberg Bible, take the time. Go to the Library of Congress or whatever. They're, they're a pastor. It's high pop. Did he do the illustration? No, he did. He was a partner. I'm not even sure. I don't know if they know who the artist was. He was he was just the you know the inventor, the printer, and I'm not quite I don't even I'm not quite sure. Boy, you've asked me two questions where you stumped me. Who was the artist? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, that was not unusual to, to you know eliminate a manuscript was not unusual. I'm sure there were a lot of artists in Germany who could who could do that. Maybe Albert Durer. Was, was Durer around at this time? I think he may have been around at this time. He's, he's my favorite artist. Okay. So this is, we're going to get to this later on. Uh, this, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about book finding methodology and um, how you do some of the craft. Here you have a woman who's sewing. That was not unusual. Women, this is from, anybody out here, Diderot, Dennis Diderot? Uh, this is from Diderot's encyclopedia. Diderot was part of the Enlightenment in the late 1700s. And what he did was, um, his contribution to the Enlightenment was to go around France documenting all the crafts. Because he wanted to demonstrate that the average craftsperson was more important to the French economy, culture, and lifestyle than uh, Louis and uh, Antoinette. So that was his. He took him 30 years to create his encyclopedia. Um, and so this is the, the bookbinding chapter and shows you some of the different uh, parts of the, of the bookbinding process. And again, if you want to see this for real, you come to my bookbindery in Sugar Town. So that's what we do. Okay, so we're going to kind of, so for, from basically from Gutenberg's time up to the uh, late, ninth, uh, late 18, 1700s, nothing really changed. You know, the, everything pretty much remained the same. Uh, you had uh, paper was made from uh, 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 linen. You had a rag man who go around the town collecting old rags. They would take the rags down to the uh, river, um, the written house, before we got to the written house. Um, pick mill on the Upper Lincoln Drive was not a new, was pretty common, was kind of a common kind of thing. And they would beat the rags into a pulp and make paper. And uh, Eli Whitten comes along in the late 1700s, 1800s, the 1700s, I'm sorry, and he invents the cotton gin. And cotton now takes over. So cotton becomes now the, uh, the, 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 the new paper source. And you make it, so you have a lot of paper coming out uh, because you, you have all this cotton available to you. So books became even more prevalent. Now, so by this time, you've got everything you wanted in the perfect medium. They're now inexpensive. Uh, just have, if you can read, you can own a book. And everybody, I should say everybody, but many, many folks had at least a family Bible uh, at home. Okay. And then we're going to kind of fast forward to the mid 1800s. The uh, Brits invent uh, machine sewing of books called the Smythe Sewer which replaced the sewing frame you see right there. And so this was really the big technological change that basically killed bookbinding as we, as you knew it for 1800, 1800 years, really. Uh, now machines are sewing books, but uh, they don't sew books as well as a human being. And I'll show you why when I show you the uh, book sewing process. So that you start getting inferior books, you're getting many, many more books. Uh, so now you can, start sending people to school to become educated and read and really learn and, and uh, get into a more, more modern society. So this was, that was a big change, I think. One, the one last thing I'm going to mention is uh, paper again. The paper again is the, is the foundation for books. In about the mid-1800s, the Germans figure out how to make wood pulp paper, which is of course what we normally have today. And what, if, if you're driven by a, a wood a, uh, a paper factory nowadays, you probably have to hold your nose as you try and buy it, and that's because of sulfuric acid. It smells like rotten eggs, right? Uh, what you do for wood pulp paper is you take the wood, you mix it with sulfuric acid and some other chemicals to break the wood into the pulp, the sluice you need, and then you can turn that pulp into paper. However, so that's great, inexpensive paper, right? Unfortunately, the sulfuric acid, the other chemicals are retained by the paper. And ultimately they burn the paper up from the outside so they yellow, become brittle, and pretty much worthless within a generation. Unlike cotton and linen paper, which again will last four, five, six hundred years or a thousand, a thousand years. 
And that, I think, is the end. So, but thanks to my daughter, who Danielle, and also Faith McCarrick is the outreach uh, person at Sugar Town. She's the person helping to coordinate uh, the workshops there. That's it for the tell part of the presentation. Any, uh, any other questions? A very good group. Yes. Because they made so many of um, the Gutenberg Bibles, were those all lithographs as the, like, as the art? Um, or were they individually painted each time? They were for, uh, initially, yes. Lith lith when did lithography get started? I'm not quite sure oh, exactly okay. when, but initially, yes, okay. hand painted yeah. is what you did. And then you had lithographs. In fact, we have lithograph stones at the bindery in, William in uh, Sugartown. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it for a different reason. We actually thin leather on the stones because oh. it's a nice flat, flat surface. Uh, and then you start getting, you know, cars, you know, modern, more modern uh, printing uh, techniques. Anybody else? No? Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, printing and book binding, showing you a little bit of what we do um, when we do make a book. Um, so when Mr. Gutenberg invented printing, he realized if he was going to print one page at a time, he'd be there all day. And he didn't want that to happen, right? He was trying to make some money. He invested 30 years, a lot of money into this process, and he needed to find a way to print really fast, get the books out. So he came up with this. This is what we call a signature. Okay. Uh, now this is a this is an octavo. You might see if you get if you know books, you might see uh, old books. If you, if you, you might see them like an eight b o eight bo. That means octavo. It's a 16 page book section, you print eight pages on one side and eight pages on the other, and you fold it, and then now you have 16 consecutive pages. Gutenberg did not print octavos, he printed folios. Uh, a folio was a big sheet, so you'd have a page here, a page here, flip the paper over, because he'd, he'd have to have another press set up, print this page, print this page, so you print four pages, fold in half, and you have a folio. If you heard of Shakespeare's folios, exact same thing. It was four pages printed, folded. Today we still call big coffee table books, photo, big photograph books, we call them folios. Basically just means it's a big sheet of paper that's folded, right? Um, so I'm going to show you a 32 page <coughs> section. It's, it goes 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. You can't, per, you can't fold more than 64 pages. So that's where you, you stop at 64. Here's a 32 page book section. So you print it out a sequence like that, okay, and then you print it on this side, and then you fold it down, so you have 1, 16, 17, and 32, and then that would go to the uh, book binder. Sometimes, even to today, you'll get an old book that is folded at the top, it was not cut. I'm going to show you why. Let me back up this up a little bit. Okay. Kind of hard to see. This guy right here, he is cutting paper. This is pre, this is 18th century, before the invention of the guillotine, right? The guillotine was great for cutting off heads, and they realized later on, great for cutting off books. Uh, just but, but before the guillotine was invented, you would actually have to plane the edges of the of the pages. I, and I did it at Waynesburg. You print, you put the you can sew the book. So the book is sewn like this. It's got folded edges here. You have to plane horizontally across. That's really going back and forth, and as you're going back and forth, it's also going across the blade and cutting off the edge, all right, the fold. Because that was such a laborious process, the book party would actually charge more to cut the book, the, the paper. Uh, so some people said, don't worry about it. I'm, I'll, I'll cut it myself with a you know, letter opener or whatever. But they may have never read the book, so you can still buy books today sometimes that are still are, are folded at the top. Okay. Um, so that's basically, and I, one other thing I wanted to mention to you is why is it called, why are the book sections called a signature? You may have noticed at the bottom of, Tom Jones here. What's that word at the very bottom of that page? Which? Which? And look at the top of the next one. Which? Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> What's that word there at the bottom of that one? 
and follow. So again, up until the early 1800s, the uh, bottoms of the books were signed by the printer. So that when the book binder then took the signatures, folded them up, they could make sure they folded them correctly by looking at the sign, and, and they would open it to the middle, and if the word at the bottom matches the word at the top, they've known they folded it correctly. So we call that, it was signed, so that, that had passed on today to be called a, it's still called a signature to this day, this very day, right. Okay, so um, I'm just going to now talk about, if, you, if there are no other questions, I'm going to talk about just a little bit about the process of making a, real quick, this will be five minutes, the process of making a, a book. Everybody interested? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're not sure, I'm not sure when, I don't think anybody really knows when this came along. Again, the Romans had the codices in the first century. They had leather thongs that they were sewing through the, the core tiles, the four, eight, 16 page sections, and putting them together. I don't, we don't believe they had a sewing frame. At some point in Europe, it appears in sometime in the Middle Ages, they developed this thing, this sewing frame. And probably what happened was a bookbinder walked past a weaver's shop one day and was watching somebody weave, and they said, wow, that's pretty clever, and I can use that in my craft. No different from Gutenberg, a goldsmith, saying, hmm, I can make movable type because I know how to use metal. I can, if I just experiment long enough, I'll figure it out. Lead, tin, antimony was the perfect combination. I'm sure some bookbinder said, I can make, I can use this. And so they invented their own uh, 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 weaving technique. It's, based, it's the same thing you have today. You have a warp, right? The warp is the up and down. And this is flax, right here is flax. And that's gonna be your warp. And then there's a, should be a piece of thread up here, it may have fallen down, and here it is. And this is going to be your weft. Thread is going to be the weft. It's going to go back. It's going to weave. We say sewing a book. We actually weave a book. And then your hands are the shuttles. So what we do is first we have to wax the thread. If you don't wax the thread, what happens is as you sew, it tends to kink. So you just get a cake of wax, and you run it through a couple times. And that way, as I'm sewing, it won't kink up on me. And this, by the way, this is, this is just uh, linen. Linen and flax are the same thing, right? Now, we actually attach the thread in bookbinding in a very unique way. I've been doing this for, since 1977. Since 1977, no one has ever told me, I do that too. Don't break my streak. <laughs> what we do is we take the needle, and I, I get these from Joanne Fabric. It's a darning, it's a darning needle. I like the, you can buy bookbinding needles, but now that I'm a little bit older, it's really hard to see. The eyes are very are smaller using book bunny needles, and I need something a little bit bigger. So we just go through the eye of the needle like you traditionally do, right? But you leave a little tail. I take the point of the needle, I'm gonna pass it through <coughs> the center of the thread. Lot, this was a lot easier when I was 18. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So I pierced that tail, right, with the needle. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that tail down. All right? So it's all the way down. And what I've done is I've created a slip knot. It slips up and a knot. Has anybody ever seen this before? Yeah. My streak's alive. <laughs> 43 years running. Okay. Now I'm going to sew. Now usually I sew, I sit on this side and sew, but I'm going to sew backwards so that you can see what I'm doing. I've only I've taken a couple sheets of paper and I've folded them. I'm going to back them up to the cords. You start at the outside. And if you, if you can't see it, come on up. If you can't see what I'm doing, come on up and you can see the process. I come through. I go into the, this is why, if I just, if I had made a square knot, 
Okay, there would be a bump at the at the end of the eye, and that bump would bump up against the fold and it wouldn't go through. So that's why we need to you make a slip knot so we have a flat knot that goes through the fold. All right. Now I'm going to come across on one side of the cord and pull it, the thread through. And then I'm going to wrap around the cord on the opposite side. So we capture the cord by wrapping around with the thread. So that first cord is now attached. If, if, uh, where's, the, uh, where's the Tom Jones? Who has the Tom Jones? So, you know old books? They've always seen ribs on the back. Now you know where the ribbon comes from. The cords remain at the, on the spine of the book and they show through the leather at the end of the process. Now I'm going to go to the center and come, come out and go back around. So now cord number two is attached. And if you have a bigger book, like again, huge Bibles and law books from the um, Middle Ages, they might have six, seven, eight cords. And they, they were often they were very thick as well, because these books were massive. And then I'm going to do the very last cord. And wrap around that. So now cord number three is attached. And then I come out at the bottom. So that finishes the first signature. And I'll show you what we did do with the second signature. You, you fold that down, that one is done. All right, that will stay on there for 500 years. I'm going to put the second signature on top, right square on top of the first one. I come in where I came, I come into second where I came out, right above where I came out. And now, now I'm going to sew the opposite direction. Just wrapping around the opposite way. So it's one continuous thread per book. This, see, this is what I'm doing right now, the looping around the cords is a major advantage to the Smite sewer uh, sewing machine, the machine. They never could invent a machine that could sew in a circle around cords. The cords are the strength of the book, right? I could take that Tom Jones and do this to it, and it wouldn't break, okay? Because the cords are, the cords are holding the spine of the book together. I can do that to that book. It's 300 years old and would wouldn't break at all. Okay, they, a machine can never, could never, they can never produce, rec replicate it. This with a machine, so you end up with a, an inferior book. Now, be careful though. What they realized, what people people like for 2,000 years, people had books with the cords showing through the spine, right? And they like that aesthetic. And also, you know, you put the label between, you do some gold toolies and gilding, very pretty. Well, they started making these books without cords, machine books, and people didn't like them. So what did they do? They started pasting cords on the back of the book, <laughs> then putting leather. So we call those faux cords, okay? So don't be fooled. Sometime in the 1800s, mid 1800s, they started putting fake cords in the backs of the books, you may think you bought a real, a handmade book, but you have it. All right, one more. And then I'm going to, I'll do one more chord. I'm going to tie this off, and sh that'll be the end of that. So you had mentioned that you can do, use just one thread per book, mm -hmm. but then it's really long if you have a big yeah. book, right? Yeah, so I, I usually do two lengths, two, it's mm -hmm. really, it's going to be, it's my two arms of my chest, twice. I have a long cord like that, then I just sew. And then since I'm sewing around the cords, for example, this morning I sewed 10 books. My daughter's doing a show, uh, what do we call it, zines? I don't know what it is. It's a zine festival in Philly on Saturday. Design, is that what it's called? I have no idea what it is. Yeah, because she's got these magazines. She's tearing through these magazines too, but she asked me to make 20 books for her. <laughs> so I sew 10 this morning, I'm going to sew 10 more tomorrow, this exact same uh, way. And then what we do is, I, I, I have the sewing frame, the, the bar to the top, and I'll sew, a, I'll sew a book, usually five or six signatures, cut the thread, and start another book. So I'll, I have 10 books stacked up, and then I can separate them when I'm finished. All right, and when you separate them, they look like 
they come off the uh, they come off looking like this. I'm gonna get to there in a minute. I know we're I got four minutes. Uh, I'm gonna finish this section. And then once I get to the end, you may, I don't know if you know it, but there's, I made, I left a little tail. From the first signature I made, I left a little tail. And what we do is we tie them, the first section you tie together like this. After this, there's something called the Coptic stitch. It's, if you sew, if you know it as a chain stitch. And what we do for the rest of the time, at the ends of the books, we Coptic stitch the uh, top and the bottom of the uh, book. So because you want them all linked together. If you look at this book, you'll see at the end of the books a chain stitch. That's the Coptic stitch that we use. So anyway, when we come out the frame, it looks like that. We then have what we call binder's board. Uh, just, you know, heavy cardboard kind of. It's very stiff. If you want to see what it's like. We attach that to the book, to the cords, actually. So the cords hold the boards on. And then over the boards, we put the uh, leather. This is called a half binding because it just has leather on the back. And this is called a three-quarter binding, you have the leather on the back and the leather in the corners. And then you have a full leather binding cord, which is the uh, 18th century books I've been passing around. Anything else? I ran through that because I know we're, we're out of time. Any other questions? Anything else? Yes? <laughs> Here's my card. <laughs> Pass them around. If you go on my website, homemindyou.com, uh, it's a link to wherever I have workshops, and um, cranking up, up. We take, usually take December off, and then start cranking them up again. I think uh, the first one is a book restoration workshop You're in January. Really huh? There you go. Right. There for 2020. Yeah, yeah. But you go to my website, you can, and they'll click you through to the whatever, whatever venue uh, where we're holding the workshop. Okay. And if you know anybody that is interested in having a book repaired. That's when I, I take off my lawyer hat when I get home, very thankfully. And I put on my bookbinding hat and I start working on old books. So if you know anybody needs a book to be fixed, come and give me a holler. Any, but any other, I don't want to shortchange you guys. Any other, I enjoy my craft. I've been, it's been a 43 year love affair. So if anybody, if you have any other questions, you know, give me, you yeah, know, just, ask me. Just to understand, so how much time do you need to find, let's say, a 200 page book? Mm. Oh, I could do it. I me, mean, I could do a two hundred page book in a day. One day. Maybe. Oh yes. The only the, the caveat is that you need to let paste and glues dry. So I can sew. I, I sewed ten books this morning before I went before I went to court. And they were five signatures each. Um, now there's different. So I sewed with one length of cord through one signature. That's called one on sewing. And you can do what's called two on, where you kind of jump between six signatures with one thread, and you can sew two at a time. That's something called three on, where you can sew three at a time with one length thread. I did so. I did the books for my daughter this morning. I did as a two on. So I was sewing two sections with one pass of the thread. So I could. So I sewed five signatures, probably six or seven minutes for one for one book. Yeah. Um. When I was reading uh, something about like, this Revolutionary War, seven hundred, and they have these things called pamphlets that they would publish. Did they sew the pamphlets? Cause no, probably uh, what's called a stitch book. Now, well, what now? What period are we talking about? Like Revolutionary yeah. War. Yeah, there was called stitch books. You would take the uh, sections. So you would, you'd have a printed material, but it would be printed in such a way that you just fold it once in the pages of sequence. Okay, and then you would. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a you would then just take a um, awl and pierce it here and here, and then just take a thread and tie it through, and that would gather the pages. There were stitch books, is what we call them. Very simple. I, like when I do a, a workshop for little kids, I had to make stitch books, but then they put marble paper on the top. That was a common book, but you, there, you don't see them anymore because they were so, uh, you know, so inferior, so ephemeral. Mm -hmm. That they you don't have lots of stitch books from the period around anymore. Anybody else? I, I just wanted to mention that um, I would love to get Ramon. I've been trying to get uh, Ramon come and do a book repair workshop. And if anybody's interested in 
you know, having a workshop like that here in Phoenixville. Um, I'll pass around a little notebook if you write your name, your contact. Once we get that coordinated, uh, maybe yeah. going into the spring sometime. Yeah. We, uh, I'll get in touch and take a photo. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we can get um, Mark's cooperation, the library's cooperation, maybe we can do it here. I, I'll tell you, if I get, if, unless I have somebody helping me, six people is pretty much where I, where I max up um, for the book repair class. And I have, I have lots and lots and lots of old books. I bring them. But if you have an old book that you think we can repair in a four or five hour workshop, so what I ask people to do is send me an email, a photograph of the book to me, and I'll let you know if I think we can get it fixed in a four or five hour workshop. Uh, if, he, if not, then I bring books and you can work on. You can work them. What I do is you deconstruct the book. I be take it apart, and then by putting it putting it back together, you get familiar with all the parts of the book, all the how the, the construction methodologies, and how to repair it. So really, that's, I think that's, I think it's our most educational workshop, the book repair workshop. All right. There's probably also a science with regard to paper, right? How do you get Old style paper, and there are, thickness of paper, and parchment yeah. paper, and grain, 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 paper. and making sure the grain's running the right direction. You want the grain to, you know, paper has a grain like anything else. You want it running vertically. That's a whole science there. I have a nephew who graduated from MIT. I taught him the book binding, and he loves it. And he's big time into paper because he's this math wizard, science wizard, and he's big time into getting make sure the grain is absolutely right. Um, so I'm not quite as finicky as, as, as he is. But that's a very important. The right paper, the right grain. In fact, what we do, we do a lot of, um, everybody familiar with fountain pen shows? Pen shows? Oh, yeah. yeah, so the January, we'll be in Philadelphia. We go, to, we go to Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and we're probably going to Boston this year. Fountain pen people are crazy about paper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I want paper. Do you have any classes? I want, we have a decal in the, at, at oh, Sugar Time, yes. and I, I keep telling them I want to use. Let's make let's make paper. We've got yeah. the decal. Yeah. We do it. Paper, yeah, absolutely. Where is the Sugar Town located? Wilston okay. Township, Boot Road, at Sugar Town Road, right at that corner. Okay. East Boot Road and Sugar Town. Road. You're right. <laughs> Correct. East Boot Road, Wilston Township. Right up from the police station. Yeah. Okay. Well, sugar time for a great blacksmith shop too. At Sugar Time? There's no blacksmith shop there. That's oh, there's one further. There's there's something further down that has said blacksmith on it, but it's not at part of Sugar Time. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and then they have one at um, the Harrington House in Bryn Mawr. Yes, and he does blacksmith. Anybody else? What a great crowd. Yeah, I work you guys make work.